going to let uh, Suzanne Dane uh, have a, take care of a few housekeeping items. Thank you. Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. I've met a lot of you before. Um, and if we haven't met before, uh, hello, I'm Suzanne Dane. I'm the Director of Community Outreach and Development for the UNC Nutrition Research Institute. And um, for a lot of you, you know, who've been to our other uh, presentations, that this is a whole new world for us here, doing this at 46. So I'm here just to um, do a little housekeeping talk before we uh, set Katie loose to tell you all about her topic. Um, there is a cash bar. It's open. You're invited to continue to go um, use it during the talk. But I would ask that you just be mindful of your neighbors and try to keep the commotion down uh, so that they can hear the presentation well. We have delightful food, compliments of rest, uh, Restaurant 46, and it's here until it's gone. So enjoy that as well. Again, just try to keep your movements uh, to a minimum, please, um, out of respect for others. And the restrooms are in the far back. Um, same applies. And this is a... Um, more relaxed sort of environment than what we're used to when we do our lectures, um, which you've, if you've been to those before. So this is meant to be very conversational. Um, if Katie brings something up, Dr. Meyer, if Dr. Meyer brings something up that you want to talk about or have a question about, please raise your hand and I will come to you with the mic and we can have a conversation going during this presentation. So with that, I'm gonna get out of the way Katie, you want to stand up so everybody can see you? Here she is, Dr. Katie Meyer. I might have to stand on this chair if you really want to see me. Does this mic work? I'd much rather shout, but they've uh, told me I need to use this mic, so. Um, and it's Katie. I prefer Katie. Um, so if you have a question and you say Dr. Meyer, I won't know what you're talking about. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight to talk about the microbiome. This is a, um, oh, something. <laughs> this is a topic very near and dear to my heart, and um, so I'm just thrilled that you're all here. I, I'm guessing that um, the media attention um, has reached most of you, and uh, it's an extremely exciting time for microbiome research. These are just a few of the recent books that have been published in the area, and there are more coming all of the time. I think most of these are actually from last year, so in a single year, this is how many were published. And it would be easy to imagine that this is a new discovery, but in fact, it's not. Uh, people have known that there's gut flora for centuries, and in fact, people have even uh, understood that the gut microbiota, the gut community, may be important for our health. So why do we see this rapid increase in attention and research now? It really relates to the dramatic decreases in um, the cost of sequencing DNA, which is one of the major ways that we study the um, gut and um, the microbiota in the gut and in other um, parts of the body. And so this is a picture of the sequ sequencing costs from, this is 2007, so you can see the remarkable decline in costs and you can see the remarkable coincident increase in microbiome research papers. And so previously, microbiome work relied on culture studies. And so you would um, isolate the organism and you would um, culture them, which was incredibly time consuming and labor, and labor intensive. And it also was very um, difficult. You needed to understand the conditions under which that organism would grow. And so it was estimated that what we know now, maybe only 25% could be cultured. And so we've really gained an incredible amount of information about just how vast our microbiota communities are. In the late 2000s, uh, everybody's very excited about the new developments and about our ability to study this and um, those developments the technological developments spurred the development of a global network dedicated to microbiome research including the united states human microbiome project and i'll talk about some of those results today but that's really 
internationally we've learned an enormous amount in just a very short period of time. Some of what we've learned has, to me at least, been truly remarkable. This is a study uh, of, of twins, identical twins, researchers recruited identical twins who were different with respect to their body weight. So one twin was overweight and one twin was lean. They took the microbiota, the gut microbiota from each twin. They transplanted the microbiota into recipient mice who were fed the same diet. And if you were the mouse that received the microbiota from the obese twin, you gained weight. And if you were the mouse that received the microbiota from the lean twin, you did not. So this has just incredible potential in terms of health interventions, right? It's, it's really quite remarkable, I find. I just want to take a quick break to tell you a little bit about what I do and why I'm drawn to this work um, in the gut microbiome. My training, I hope you can all see this because it would be a shame if you couldn't read this. This says, and this is what you can say to Suzanne when you're leaving tonight, you can say, and it was so typically brilliant of you to have invited an epidemiologist. <laughs> Epidemiologists study populations and uh, so, uh, one of the studies that I work, which was alluded to, is uh, the, the CARDIA study, Coronary Artery Risk Development in, in Young Adult Study. And CARDIA started in 1985-86 in four urban centers, Birmingham, Alabama, Chicago, Illinois, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Oakland, California, where investigators recruited roughly 5,000 individuals. Uh, people were matched with respect to race. It was uh, African American, European America. They were, res they were matched with respect to gender, and so there are roughly equal numbers. Um, they got some folks who were um, quite educated and some, some who weren't. At the time, people were, the participants in CARDIA were 18 to 30 years old. So CARDIA is still going, and that is what I, those are the data that I work with. We're currently in year 30 of the CARDIA study, which means we're at about 3,600 people. Those people have been participating in CARDIA for 30 years. And so maybe it's not surprising that when we ask them for a fecal sample, they are delighted to provide that to us. And um, so we're now collecting um, fecal samples so that we can study um, gut microbiome with respect to the, in the CARDIA study with respect to 30 years of phenotypic and genomic data. So it's really this incredibly rich research um, uh, resource. Now, the, one of the challenges, oops, sorry. One of the, so some of the challenges of, um, well, let's start with the, with the positives. Epidemiologic studies are, are um, incredibly useful in science because they are, first of all, human studies. We don't have to ask whether we're going to respond the way um, the study that is in mice response, right? Epidemiologic studies are large, which is very nice because we can get the full range of health behavior data. So it's hard if you take maybe 20 people off the street, maybe you won't get, um, for example, a vegetarian. But if you have a huge number of people, you're more likely to see an incredible range of really what is people are experiencing in the population. Epidemiologic studies, because they last so long, we can see how people's health status changes over time. And so for all these reasons, epidemiologic research is incredibly important for understanding health and health behaviors and things like diet and the gut microbiome. One of, some of the limitations, though, of epidemiologic studies, and I'm sure you've experienced this, is that sometimes, you know, if you pick up a newspaper <laughs> and it says fiber, Everybody should eat fiber. And then the next week it says, you know what, actually fiber doesn't seem to be so important. And then the next week, you know, something else comes along. And so epidemiology, you know, it's sometimes very difficult to maintain faith as an epidemiologist because you really do get these very different results. And you think, what's the right answer? One of the things that um, we're looking at more and more is just how 
variable individuals are. And so as an epidemiologist, we, as in epidemiology, we really focus on population means. And this is a great example. I don't know how many people saw this um, was reported just last week or the week before. This guy is so interesting. He, um, Kevin Hall, he's at the, um, he's at the NIH. He's one of these intramural researchers, which means he's just paid to think. And, um, and he apparently has, a, I shouldn't say weakness, right? But he apparently really enjoys um, reality TV. And um, so he watches The Biggest Loser and thinks, I'm going to do a study, a research study. Kevin Hall uh, was trained as a physicist, and he builds mathematical models to uh, project how uh, people are going to change weight given certain uh, metabolic baselines and then their health behaviors or their diets. And so he, um, he got some folks from The Biggest Loser and followed them up to really see how many of them would regain their weight and why is it so difficult to maintain weight loss? And what he saw and what the, what the media really focused on is this. I don't know, did, it, did it, anybody see this article? Did you look at the photos of people? I was looking at the photos and I, even, before I, even before I went to the literature and looked at the article, I thought, you know, some of these people look great. I thought not everybody even just based on the photos, it was clear that a lot of the folks, maybe they didn't maintain complete weight loss, but they, they, they looked pretty good. And, and so you knew that there was a little more to the story, right? And um, if you, so one of, the one, of the, one of the really unfortunate things that happens, and we actually learned this in 1950, but that's another story, because we do keep relearning things from, <laughs> from 1950. Um, in 1950, um, this is kind of interesting in and of itself, partly because I'm from Minnesota, which is where Ansel Keys um, was a faculty member at the University of Minnesota, and that's um, who developed the K-rations. So Ansel Keys uh, got permission from the uh, government to take um, conscientious objectors and put them in a study that was um, to test uh, human starvation. And the idea was that this was um, better than going to war for these folks, and what we could learn a lot about how to um, help people who were living in countries where they weren't getting enough food. And so these folks, um, they, he starved them, really, and then after, they had a refeeding. And he realized that as, they, as he refed them, they preferentially um, put on fat. So that's a very unfortunate thing about dieting, is that if you, if you lose the weight and then you start to put it back on, um, you may actually preferentially uh, put on fat. And this is another um, one of, the, one of um, Kevin Hall's reports, is that you lose the weight and your metabolism goes down. And it actually goes, goes down to below what you would expect based on your body weight. So based on your body weight, we expect a certain resting, meta resting metabolic rate. You, we expect that you're just going to burn a certain number of calories just sitting there listening to me or lying or in bed or whatever. And these people actually, um, they weren't burning as many calories. And that's kind of very insidious, right? Because now they need to, um, to eat even less than if they hadn't gone through the weight loss experience, if they had just been that weight all along. And so you see these two means. Over the six-year time period, the resting metabolic rate declined. But these are all the people. And you can see just all the variability. This is what we never show you. This is step one in an epi analysis. We sit down to the data. We're so excited. We have a new data set. And one of the first things we do is we look at all the data in all the detail. And so here you see all the individual data points. And what do you see? It's incredibly diverse, right? We get rid of all that, and we just show you a mean. And so if you imagine, you know, Kevin Hall's study, imagine he had more people like this. Then what would the means look like, right? This would be shifted up, right? We all have an uncle who lived to 90, smoking two packs a day, and is now like an age group 
winner in triathlons, right? We've like, <laughs> it's always been like why we know that, wait a minute, are cigarettes bad for you? Well, we've got Uncle Elmer. And um, so if you had a study filled with Elmers, right, you can imagine that you wouldn't find that cigarettes are harmful, cause lung cancer. And, um, and so in epidemiology, when we see all these divergent results, one of the things that you think about is, let's think of the makeup of the population and what portion of the population looks like this versus that, right? Sometimes you see that soy is, so there are studies showing that soy is protective against breast cancer in Asian countries, but not in Western countries. That may relate to the microbiome, because if you eat a lot of soy, your microbiome, you may train your microbiome, or you, the microbiome may so select for organisms that are used to soy as an energy source, and they produce these health-related metabolites. So we can really start to understand, okay, we see these health, this, uh, di this dietary component seems healthy in this study, but not in another. Can we think about it in terms of the average and the, the groups? Because all we're doing, we call it a weighted average, right? This is, which is really the most important aspect of life, and we use it all the time. I mean, this is me as an epidemiologist. I think weighted averages are just everything, right? Because think about it, whether you like somebody or not, it's just a weighted average of your experience. If you have not that many bad experiences with them, you still like them. If it starts to shift into too many bad experiences, then you find yourself shifting in another direction. And so everything, right, you're mixing paints, it's all a weighted average. And so that's really what, as an epidemiologist, we're trying to move toward. Because this is just an example of how you could imagine epidemiologic research. You could just think we're spinning wheels and this week we're going to, oh look, we're going to have a report in their newspaper, cardia can cause depression in twins. <laughs> yes, and I had a biostatistics TA who used to say, you need three thesis papers. You need to look at carrots and lung cancer in 40 to 49 year olds, carrots and lung cancer in 50 to 59 year olds. <laughs> It's kind of a joke, but here it is. <laughs> it was a joke based on a cartoon. Um, luckily, help is on the way. Uh, the Nutrition Research Institute, we are all about studying this individual variability and how it relates to health. So the mission is to enhance understanding of health and human development through greater knowledge of how genetic epigenetic and metabolic mechanisms affect people's requirements for and responses to nutrition. Does anybody have any questions or conversation points? Oh, yes, here. In some of these studies, can you go back and get their genetic makeup and then see what the, you can learn from that? Yes, and p there are people, so I see Saroja here in the back. She does just that. She's a genetic epidemiologist. I don't know if Saroja wants to respond to that point. <laughs> uh, what was your question? I didn't get it completely. What, the question was whether you can, so now we see all this variability, and now we have improved ability to look at people's genotypes. Do we go back in those studies? Mm -hmm. If we have DNA available, yes, we can. Yeah, and yeah, be, really begin to um, subgroup people. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Are the data collection groups like 23 and me helpful at all because you have a big DNA and then others, then other aspects are self-reported? You know, anything y'all can use to get a bigger data set faster? You know, I don't know how available those data are. Does anybody know? I do think that they, um, I saw um, somebody from 23andMe present recently at a conference, and they really are able to do some very interesting genetic research just because of the sheer volume of samples that are coming in. And um, I don't know the extent to which they collaborate with, say, people like me and Saro. Did you know? But, 
Yeah, they are generating. Yes, and that's another point that she talked about because when somebody sends a sample to 23andMe, then a lot of times other people in their families also send it, and so they can really do. I mean, she presented research. It was very, very interesting. Yes. Ask them. Yes, it's always worth it. We can. <laughs> Saroja can. person who actually sends their DNA into 23andMe, you can get the raw data file out. So investigators could actually use those data. Okay, great. Any other questions? This is a really neat example. These, um, this research team in Israel, they've been doing just fascinating studies. Um, related to the microbiome. And one of the things that's so interesting about their work is that they often combine models. So they'll have an animal study, and then they'll do something in humans. And so in this study, they had a cohort of 800 people, like Cardia, except a little smaller. And they um, gave them all uh, continuous glucose monitors. They collected all their diet information. and. Um, they collected their gut microbiome data, and then they tried, and then they had a one-week kind of embedded intervention where everybody got standardized meals. I think it was only breakfast. And so now they know, they know how people are typically eating because they've completed all their various diet surveys. And they also, and they know how their blood glucose is changing because they're wearing the glucose monitor. And now they know how they're responding to identical meals because on day one, everybody's eating oatmeal and a banana and apparently a cookie. And on day two, you know, everybody's eating whatever. And uh, so one of the fascinating things here is, you know, we all want to kind of eat in a way that stabilizes our blood sugar, right? Glycemic index, we've had various positive and no findings on glycemic index if you've been following the literature. I personally sub uh, 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 submitted a, a null finding of the glycemic index, but I know that other people have found that it's important. So here you see that this person, participant 445, when you, when you don't, you never have to be worried about enrolling in a study because you'll just be referred to as participant 445. Now, Look at how flat their glucose response is to a cookie as compared to a banana. And this person has this response to a cookie and not to a banana. So this is really what we're moving towards in terms of understanding our personal response to different foods and eating accordingly. Not to suggest that some people should eat a cookie, you know, maybe this is an orange instead. But nonetheless, there is individual variability. Oh, there we go. So this is, uh, I mentioned the Human Microbiome Project. Remember, that was the United States contribution to this global network early on. We call them consortia. And so the, the, the US said, this is important area. Well, NIH, we're going to put some money into this. They, they, they collected stool samples from 300 individuals. I think they were all from St. Louis and Houston, the, the HMP, which we call it, folks, were not epidemiologists. And what that means is I, I, I could never figure out who these people were. 300 people, I know that. What are their ages? What are the, you know, epidemiologists, we talk about table one. And everybody knows what table one looks like. It means it's a table and it tells you who's in the study. <laughs> what are their ages? So nonetheless, they had 300 people and they were healthy people. And the major, one of the major goals of the Human Microbiome Project was to define what a healthy core microbiome looks like. Because we want to know what a healthy microbiome looks like in order to understand its association with different phenotypes, right? What's an unhealthy microbiome? We want to be able to define those things. We're at a point in the science where we don't even know that. So you know what's a... What's an unhealthy blood pressure? What's a healthy blood pressure? You know, cholesterol, you get your numbers, you kind of know, have a sense of it. With microbiome, we simply still do not know. And that was one of the big findings of the HMP. They got 300 people, they're all healthy, and look at the variability. Incredible variability. Now, what's even more incredible, so this is person one, 
and that's their microbiome. And what this means is that most of their microorganisms are from this phylum. Most uh, of the gut microbiome is from two phyla, um, Bacteroidetes and um, Firmicutes, so the green and the blue. And uh, this, so these are all individuals. Does, everybody, does that make sense? It's just like a cross-section. And so this is at the phylum level. So if we remember back to, you know, 10th grade biology, phylum's way up here. We've got all the way down here to get to species. And so you can imagine just how much more diverse this gets across individuals. And so then they say, well, now we can't actually define what a quote-unquote healthy microbiome looks like, at least if we consider how do you define a healthy microbiome? Well, we take healthy people and we look at their microbiome. So some people have said, well, maybe that's not actually, you know, it's kind of like, what's uh, blood pressure? This is another population perspective. What's a healthy blood pressure in the US is different from if you go to um, some maybe agrarian society where blood pressures are just much, much lower. So, but that's nonetheless, they, they found this incredible diversity among healthy individuals and really, it's just so vast. Now, this is, this is because we have all these different microbiota communities, right? HMP, I think, I don't know how many communities they measured, but you've got the skin, you've got the oral. I think oral, they had about 21 sites or something. It was because one of the HMP guys was it actually a dentist. No, 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 that's just a side note. But you've got the skin, the oral, the microbiota, the, the, the gut. You, you know, you have lung. Um, you have vaginal, you have all these different um, locations, and it's just incredibly vast and very diverse. And so we're really now only beginning to understand just how huge it is and what it means for health. We do know that in, from cross-species studies that diet is, is partially um, involved in shaping the microbiome. So you don't need to understand this or any of this, but I think it's just clear that here we've got the animal, animal and plant and plant diets across these species, and you can see that the microbiome is different. That's really all this slide is showing. So this, the take home point of this is that diet is important. We have co-evolved with our gut microorganisms and one of the nice things about that is they do some things that we don't. So there's like a whole metabolic capacity component that they're fulfilling that we don't have to, including around fiber, which is not digestible, but if we get some benefit, maybe it's due to the microbiota metabolism. Are there any other questions, discussion points, thoughts? Yes, we've got. So, if we were eating meat most of the time and now we switch to a plant diet, how soon does also our gut microbiota change? I just want to point out that she and I did not talk before this presentation <laughs> because the slide here is this really interesting study by Lawrence David, who's now at Duke University. He did this while he was at Harvard. Um, working with um, somebody who was doing this from the very beginning days. And he took um, 10 people. This is a publication from Nature. Did you know this was <laughs> 10 people? And he said it was a, what we call a crossover study. And so you're first going to get diet A. We're going to randomly assign it. OK, so day one, some number of you will get diet A and some number will get diet B and then we're going to observe you and then we're going to have what's called a washout period to, you know, eliminate all the effects and then you're going to come back and you're going to get the other diet. Okay, so 10 people and this was an extreme diet because the people either got a diet that was animal, I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't write meat, it was animal based so it included things like milk and cheese or it was um, purely plant based. And so very few people really, I guess vegan, um, this would be um, a vegan diet. 
And so they observed micro, um, they observed some compositional changes. A lot of times when you look at microbiome papers, which I know you will all do um, after leaving tonight and moving forward because it's such a fascinating field, you're going to realize that the literature kind of, there's a lot of talk about microbiome composition or structure. That's like who's there? What are the microorganisms? And then you can talk about microbi microbiota function. What are they doing? Okay, so what are they doing? Are they what genes are they expressing? Uh, expressing what metabolites are they producing? As a functional measure, so these are both functional measures, and uh, they observed that there were some compositional changes within 24 hours. You see these changes, and this is the production of different short chain fatty acids, and so you can see just how different the production of metabolites, and we consider these you know, bioactive metabolites from food. They're from diet. They rely on the gut microbiota for some metabolic component, right? That's like the, the piece that we have given off. We're not really involved. We've kind of a division of labor. And, um, and so you can see these gene expression changes in the microbiota, in the microorganisms, and you can see changes in the production of short-chain fatty acids within 24 hours, which is really quite remarkable. Now, this is an extreme diet, so, but you could have a conversation. You know, so one of the things that this does not address is this is the microbiome function. You have a microbiome, and it, it changes. So really, when you think about it, to some extent, it's not that surprising, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you eat meat, it makes sense that the microbiome you have is going to generate uh, the short-chain fatty acids that would be generated from meat, right? And so one of, the, uh, one of the counterpoints that somebody could say is this, this may not reflect a change in the microbiome as much as it reflects the activity of the microbiome you have based on what you're feeding it. So that also makes sense, right? But we're gonna see something, um, we're gonna see some other examples uh, later on that are kind of more about long-term diet, in my opinion. It's not yet established. Any other questions? This is one of my favorite papers ever, by the way. It's published in Nature, yes. Uh, the, the, the diagram of diversity of, of the microbes, similar to the, the slide that you had before, to kind of prove the point that the diversity of microbes didn't really change, but maybe the... He does have a diagram. I can send you the, I can send you the paper. Okay. Yes. Great. I can send you all the paper. Just leave your... <laughs> um, he does have a, have a diagram, and the way... He, he would, the way he interprets it is that it changed the composition. It did change the composition, but it changed it modestly, and it may not have changed it in terms, you know, sometimes you talk about within versus between changes, and so you and I are different. Can we still detect whether we're different after a change? So if we both change in terms, whoops, in terms of the metabolite, the with, are within, so whether I eat a plant or a meat diet is going to affect this more than the difference between you and me. You and I are going to be very similar once we're both on meats. And so you can say that the compositional data, you could still distinguish people, maybe more than the diet, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? It's kind of subtle, but he does talk about how there are compositional changes. But if you really look at the data, you could say that the compositional changes were mi minor compared to the individual. Is there anything as extreme as missing microbes from certain diet? You know, a lot of people, in order to look at that, you'd probably have to look at the data. Because one of the challenges of microbiome, the microbiome data, is it's, you know, you've probably all heard of this concept, big data. So you get out gobs and gobs of data. And so you have to do what's called data reduction so that you can kind of show. I mean, I think I actually have. We could just take a second.
to show you. I might have it. No. Okay, but this shows it, kind of. So this, this is, we saw, this is actually showing that the, um, so this slide we saw, right, showing the compositional differences. These are the genes. So there are thousands of genes in the gut microbiota. So what they're doing here, they do what's called data reduction. They're actually assigning them to some metabolic activity so that they can present it because they can't tell you, they can't present a nice figure that's at all interpretable based on thousands of genes. Here is a common measure. A lot of times they take this, these data and they say, how diverse is your microbiome? So who, how, many, how many distinct microorganisms do you have? Um, how even is it? So say you have five and say one person has five microorganisms and it's 20, 20, you know, or 100 microorganisms and it's 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, and one person has 100 microorganisms and it's 1, 1, 1, 1, and what is it, 96, you know, and so that's kind of evenness. And so you can see that they do what's called, but what the data reduction. And so that really makes it difficult unless you have the raw data to, 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 to define specific differences. They will note that there are specific um, differences. And one of the things that they, I remember that they mentioned was that they had, I think, one vegetarian who somehow they managed to convince to eat a animal-based diet. Um, and, um, and that person um, had a, uh, a lot of um, uh, Prevotella, which is um, one that's uh, associated with um, fiber and digest and dealing with kind of like non-digestible um, polysaccharides. So, yeah, they do talk about. You almost feel like an epidemiologist reading, uh, or you're reading an epi paper reading some of these microbiome papers because one study will say, "Oh, we saw this bug," and then the next study will, "Oh, we saw this bug," and it just becomes very confusing. Okay, so those are backup slides for your questions. Oh, so this is um, another really wonderful demonstration of individual variability and how the gut microbiome may help us understand why some people could respond positively to a specific diet and other people may not respond to that same diet. These folks were given a fiber diet and some of them, when they were given the fiber diet, oh, here it is, Prevotella. Um, Prevotella is, that's a microorganism that's involved in production of short-chain fatty acids from non-digestible polysaccharides, which is what you get when you eat fiber. And so some folks, um, ha they have an increase in Prevotella. So I give you fiber, fibrous toast here. I give you fiber and I, I measure your gut microbiome, and you have an increase in Prevotella. This other group of folks had no change in Prevotella. And the benefit on glucose metabolism, so one of the things that we think fiber's good for, right, is glucose and the spike that's kind of like the glycemic index and high fibrous foods are supposed to kind of dampen these glu glu um, glycemic spikes, right? And so, uh, the people who had improved glucose metabolism were the ones who had this change in the gut microbiota. And if you did not have the change in the gut microbiota, fiber did not positively affect your glucose metabolism. So that's just a really fascinating example, right? And this is another great study that combines these models. They combine an animal model because the animal model is really nice because you can do what you want. Um, you know, you have to be ethical, obviously, but you can do things that are harder to do than um, human studies where you can't, for example, get through IRB. I'm going to put them in a cage. I'm going to feed them, you know, so we, um, so that's, that's what's really nice. You have this controlled animal component where you, where they're very similar gen gen genetically and uh, you can um, have absolute control and then you have the human, human component. This is one of the, um, this is uh, something that I study and others study this as well at the, at the NRI. Are there any other questions, discussion points? Yes? 
No. Um, this is a metabolism from uh, a couple of nutrients that are found in fish, eggs, and red meat. So you eat fish, eggs, red meat. Whether you have a certain um, gut microbial activity, there's also a gene component involved, but we're going to overlook that for now. Um, you produce this metabolite, uh, called, we're going to call it TMAO. And TMAO has been associated with heart disease. And so this is how you read this when you, when you look at your epi paper. Uh, here's what we do a lot of times. We're going to split TMAO, which is kind of like cholesterol or anything else. We measure it in your blood. We've got a level of cholesterol. You can imagine that. And we've got the people with high levels and the people with low levels and the people in between. And so these are the people with high levels, quartile four. They have the, they're the highest 25% of the sample. And you can see that they increase their heart attack and stroke risk over three years. So that's TMAO. It's a, uh, it comes from these foods. It requires gut microbial activity. And it seems to be associated with CVD, with cardiovascular disease. Now, this is where I said earlier, you know, we talk about how these studies that give you a meal and then look at your production of something, and we say that's microbial function. I think some of the most interesting stuff looks at people with respect to their long-term diet. And now we give them something that we know, and we see what their response is. So when you have, uh, when you give vegans and vegetarians so this is our fasting levels. Fasting levels, vegans and vegetarians have lower levels of TMAO, this thing that causes cardiovascular disease, than omnivores. And when you give them, um, when you give them an egg and you look at uh, their production of TMAO over time, what you see is that the vegans and vegetarians really don't seem to be producing. These people actually gave red meat specifically. Okay, when you give red meat, Again, they got the, vegan, the five vegan vegetarians to eat red meat. Um, so anyway, they don't produce this metabolite, and the omnivores do. So that's just really fascinating because when we looked at this other paper, right, we had this conversation. When we talked about this, we had the conversation, was this really altering your gut microbiome, or was this activating your current microbiome, right? That's kind of a difference, right? This, we can say, this is the activation of your current microbiome based on, really, a long-term dietary pattern. So if you don't eat meat, you may, it appears, lack the microbial machinery to produce what appears to be a harmful metabolite from red meat. That's just kind of a beautiful example, isn't it? And now we see something similar, except completely opposite. Um, for this is a soy metabolite. Now, I think I told you that sometimes you see soy is inversely associated with breast cancer in Asian, in China, for example, but it's not associated. You can find all kinds of epi uh, <laughs> studies with different results for soy. Um, but you know, one of the a recent meta-analysis said, okay, in Asian samples, soy is protective. In Western samples, it's not. So, one of the ways we might think about that is here, this person looked at vegetarians. This is a, this is a Western sample. So, in, so in, in Western vegetarians, they get a lot of their proteins from soy. And these people are producing at a much higher rate this metabolite that appears to be protective. And so I think it was something like 60% of the vegetarians produced it, only 25% of the non-vegetarians produced it. So that's kind of a very interesting example. This is another metabolite that is dependent on the gut microbiota to, to produce it. So if I consume soy and if somebody else has consumed soy, we won't all produce the metabolite. If you're Asian, and you're consuming, reg what they've actually found this, that Asian individuals who are consuming soy regularly, that's a, a, a long-term typical diet, they're more likely to produce this metabolite. So 
you know, when you think about, oh, I'm eating healthy today, I've never consumed soy in my life, but today I'm going healthy, I'm eating soy, it may not actually yield the healthy, and so it's really a, um, a great example of the importance of kind of your long-term diet and this notion that if you have an overall healthy diet generally over the long term, you can, you can even be a vegetarian and eat a steak and it may not produce anything, <laughs> who knows, at least this metabolite. So this means we have a lot of time for questions, right? What time is it? Oh, really? That's it? You know, people have told me that I blather on, and I never believe it. <laughs> yes? Uh, this is in reference to the last uh, slide, but I have read maybe three different systems of the Bible, and I don't know Yes, that is that is true, and fermentation can absolutely affect how um, metabolites are produced and how nutrients are accessed. So yes, in terms of observational studies, that might definitely come into play. And what I mean by that is just kind of a an observational. We're just going out and we're measuring people um, in a controlled study like this, where they actually you could you could you could imagine a more controlled study where you where you give the fermented soy and, and then you can actually see. So that's interesting. Yes? Um, the GMO soy, so if you're on oh. GMO soy and you're giving it to organic soy, have you done any studies that that makes a difference? I know um, this is one of the, um, you know, one of the great things about being a scientist is that you um, <laughs> learn so much, but often you just kind of so I don't know very much about GMO um, foods generally. I don't know if anybody else here has more knowledge of um, GMO. They banned it in all Canada. Do you have? A, do you know about this? Other than other than the Plants for Human Health next in the building next door to us, that they study a lot of this and uh, a researcher and I can't the name is escaping me from NC State at Plants for Human Health presented on the differences between GMO versus um, non-GMO plant sources in um, different uh, behavioral outcomes but they associated that with digestion and what, I can't think of the name well, did they find differences um, and in that presentation they did not and that was in a rodent model but yeah. this, so the, and so what so what they're if I remember correctly, um, what their, their point was that GMO, we immediately think the GMO is bad. Um, and GMO just means that it was genetically modified in some way. And in, it, that could have been modified to be more digestible by us or for us to, be, to make the nutrients within that food more available. So GMO is not necessarily a negative outcome. It's in what way that was a genetically modified organism was the point of, of, right. of their presentation. Back to the soy and Asians, I know that uh, one of the ways that soy is beneficial in some people and not others is in the conversion of diazine to equal. Yes, that's, this is equal. Yeah. Yes. And that's partially at least uh, mediated by gut bacteria. Yes. So do Asians have more of the whatever bacteria than uh, Westerners do to make that conversion? Well, they produce more equal than In Westerners, Asia. yes, um, when given soy. Mm -hmm. um, how that relates, so one of the nice things about these metabolites, especially if they're dependent on gut microbiota, is you can give somebody a food and you can look at their metabolite response and you can kind of make an inference that because this is dependent on gut microbiota, it involves a gut microbiota pathway. But the specific organisms and genes working at that level in the gut microbiome, for most of these really haven't been identified. We're only now beginning. And so I don't know as much about equal as I do about TMAO. TMAO, there have been some recent studies, say in the past five years, 
three years, looking at and identifying some specific uh, genes that are involved, microbial genes, and different um, microorganisms. One of the interesting findings, general findings, is that there are a number, apparently a number of pathways through which TMAO is generated. Yeah, the question I had with that research was if you took the same group of vegetarians and started giving them the choline and carnitine that are made, would they gradually adapt their microbiome? I don't know. I don't think studies have, like that have been done. That, that hasn't been done, no. I don't think no. so. <laughs> but for soy, I think um, somebody yeah. did a one-month intervention and uh -huh. found that after one month of um, consuming soy, your production of equal did not, in fact, change. Okay. And so if it relates, so this is just kind of like my um, working theory to integrate some of the evidence. But if there is this kind of establishment of, a, of microbial functional uh, capability uh, over long, based on long-term diet, at least with respect to soy and equal, it must be longer than a month. Right. So, OK. Yeah. But those are really important questions as we start to think about how can we use this information for health interventions. So when we tell if we really want to you know, shape the microbiome in a way that's healthy, uh, how long do people need to eat a certain way in order for, so, yes? If we have our genome tested, found, uh, would it be beneficial, and who should we give it to, our doctor or a research group or, you know? Do you mean um, your personal genome yeah. or the microbiome's genome? My, my personal, I guess. That would be a question for Saroja, who happens to be here, luckily. <laughs> <laughs> Saroja knows all about. <laughs> no, you can get your genome done, but in our... Okay, okay, yeah, you can get your genome sequenced. That's what your question was, right? Yeah, you can. But only thing is that in our here, we don't have the capability to do the whole genome for a person. But we have in UNC where we can do it. UNC Chapel Hill. Oh, cost. Uh, right now, the cost is about $3,000. Now, you can go to things like 23andMe, can't you, for 100 uh, But they won't do whole genome. Oh, I mean, right. they, they might do whole genome, but the problem is that I don't know how many people can interpret that. Yes, that's so what that's interpretation is a big problem. So uh, it, a few years ago, it used to be $10,000. Now it has come to 3000 If you wait a little bit, maybe it will go down. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know because it's pretty good. Uh, it, the way the prices have come down with the new sequencing capabilities, I wouldn't be surprised that it will go down further. It used to be 10,000 about seven, eight years ago. So now it is almost 3,000. But I think the interpretation, and you kind of mentioned this, yeah, would, who would you very, give it to, your doctor? Difficult. I think that's very, uh, so for example, I think with 23andMe, there, I mean, I don't know how many of these, uh, the genes where they would say, I mean, I think coffee is one where, okay, if, if you have this, genotype, then you probably shouldn't drink more than five cups of coffee. 250 that they know, yeah, so you can interpret. They look for about 250 genes, and they will give you some recommendation on the basis of the 250 genes. Yes, for $100, right? $100 still? Oh, really? Get in before it goes to four. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, did I take it right that you're analyzing the DNA of the microbes? Yes. Do they vary from individual to individual, or are they fairly consistent? No, they vary dramatically, which is, oh, this is kind of interesting. So, let me see. You got one of the answer slides. Pardon? You got one of the answer slides. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So this is actually, it's a very, this is another really interesting finding that we got from the Human Microbiome Project that I don't think people anticipated. So one thing was, I think they collect, you know, they got the 300 people and they thought, okay, we're going to see some consistency across healthy people in gut microbiota. 
and you see all that variability, right? right. Those are the organisms. Now, the organisms um, have genes. Right. So if you go down to the gene level, you see this, which is much more stable, right? right. Yes, and so what they've said is there are, there's a lot of redundancy in the um, presence of genes. And so the metabolic potential is there for these people, um, irrespective of their composition. And now that's part of why maybe, sometimes you'll see this when you, when you read the paper on microbiome, they'll talk about diversity. I don't know if people have seen, but a lot of times in the news, you'll see gut microbiome diversity. So if you have a lot of different bugs, that's often a good thing with respect to health. And one of the thoughts is that maybe the more diverse your microbiome, um, you know, the better chances are that you'll have all these genes for various metabolic functions. But this is a really important finding. Now this is very interesting. So here you see all this variability. I'm just going to tell you this is what you see. You're going to have to trust me. <laughs> this one says, okay, there's a lot of variability in composition. Who's there? Then we look at the genes, DNA, and there's very little variability. Now we're going to look at RNA, which is gene expression, okay? And we see more variability. So it's just really kind of fascinating. Now this is what I would call a functional measure, gene expression. What happens when you're, you express genes? You get these products, like the metabolites, right? And so those metabolite production, gene expression, even though you have, we all may be very similar with respect to having these genes, um, the expression is different. So this is an argument for everybody, so much of the research till now has focused on composition. And we've learned a lot, I think. But given the fact that people can have such diverse microbiomes and still be healthy, they can have such diverse microbiomes and still have all the genes, some very similar genes for function, for activities that we care about. Um, people are moving more and more into these kind of functional measures, looking at metabol, looking at the products of gene expression, looking at gene expression. I don't know if that answered your question. Yes. <laughs> What varies from individual to individual? Is the, the percentage mix of the microbes? Yes, which microbes, there's actually very little um, similarity from person to person. So the mix, I mean, this is just at a, at a phylogenetic. So you can see if we go back to the bigger picture of this, um, what varies most from person to person is um, so this is just at the phylum level. And if you go lower, you'll see more and more. So when you look at a data table, and you, get, you take the microbiome DNA, you, um, you assign it to a taxonomic group. This is this phylum, this class, this order, family, and you go down. And then you look at your data table of people with respect to all the bugs they have. Okay, Some bugs, everybody has some. And some bugs, you know, not very few people have them. Some bugs, everybody has some, but very, very few of them. So it's incredibly diverse, um, we are, with respect to the bugs. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the bug. Well, you know, people, the scientists love to parse. And so, I don't know if you know this, um, but um, so microbiome actually refers officially to the genes, the genetic material, and microbiota are the organisms. Are we out of time? I, we are about out of time. So suddenly everybody has their hands in the air. So Oh, really? Let's take yeah. a few more. What so I'm going to, I saw back here first and then, but I do want to be respectful of everybody's oh. time. So if you do need to go, please go ahead. But here we go. Oh, yes. I told you I'd let you know my <laughs> question. Um, so you're talking about the diversity of the microbiome, and I know the food industry has gotten kind of hip to this game. So you're starting to see the proliferation of probiotic added foods and fermented foods, fermented beverages. So I'm just curious about what your opinion is on 
the benefits or the harm of this new market segment of the food industry that they've discovered and what that could potentially do to impact, you know, right. an individual or just as, as a society? Well, unfortunately, um, the things that you're probably most interested in are also the things that I know um, very little about. <laughs> so I did anticipate, to some extent, these questions. My reading of the probiotic literature is very mixed. In fact, there's a researcher at UNC who studies colon cancer, and she studied, uh, um, correct me, I think it's something like VSL number three, or it's like a major probiotic that you see in the stores. I've seen it. It's blue and white. Um, <laughs> the label. <laughs> um, and she actually found that it, and I can't remember if it increased the incidence of cancer or if it decreased survival among, and these were mice, and they're germ-free mice, so they're very different from people. But um, I haven't found, and I think there are some questions of um, how much of the probiotic is, um, gets down when taken like that. That said, I'm all about whole foods, and so, and I think, you know, um, sauerkraut, I mean, all these fermented, so many of the fermented foods, I think, uh, in terms of taking them as a whole food, are, I would consider those healthy, personally. You know, we haven't done research on it specifically, but, um, but in terms of, as, a, as opposed to taking a probiotic, a pill with those organisms, but... Um, because I just don't know how that actually, and even when you think about the just the the sheer the you know the volume of the microbiome and the sheer number of them, how much is that going to change? But there are studies. I have also seen studies where, and I can't remember if this was um, probiotics or uh, or, a, a, or a prebiotic, which would kind of be like fiber. Um, but they found that. Um, if you have a good diet, and this makes sense just generally, if your overall diet is good and your health is good, it's much less likely to have an impact. And so there's that too. So both things, I think, argue for um, just if you're generally healthy, then you probably don't need that, even if it is beneficial, which we don't even know yet. <laughs> Katie, I think I have one back here, over this way. Oh. Okay, yeah. I was just curious about um, the diversity within families and family members. So they would have, you know, I guess similar genetic um, makeup, but may, and share similar um, diets. Yes. And do you still see the diversity within within family groups? You do see um, a rich diversity between people, but it is also true that they are more similar than somebody than just a random person. And I don't know if that's environment, you know, but you, you know, the, even the dog study, I don't know if you all saw the dog study. Yeah, you know, we've kind of got our dog's microbiome, which um, you can link. I think they did this thing where, you know, it was like those things that you do as kids, the dog and the person, you could, you could link them based on, <laughs> based on the microbiome. <laughs> yes, but in terms of the ge genetics, we do know that genetics plays a role in shaping the microbiome. We know that because of just studies of families and twins, but that is a whole new huge area, and I don't, I don't work in that, but I, I, yeah, that's something. Mm -hmm. so. I'm just wondering what you're hearing or reading about um, fecal transplants for gut health for people who have severe gut issues like C. difficile and things C. like difficile. that. C. difficile, yes. I think that's the example where um, they've been shown. Um, and um, so uh, I, I, I know that MIT and other, other places, I mean, there are doing clinical trials on that. And I've also, I know there's a whole do-it-yourself um, kind of network, um, <laughs> which I've seen on the, on the internet, the World Wide Web. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've learned about the capsule approach versus the <laughs> other options. Um, so, yeah. Oh, do you know about this? Yeah, I've worked at a hospital, and, and I know um, people with chronic diseases, that, that's like the final uh, resort. Yeah. Uh, and they would have to have a fecal sample from her, and then they 
do like a colonoscopy, they put it up there and see if it stops. Uh, they do like family members, and you have to be tested for HIV, you have to be, you have to be all that. And because the child, right. you know, is young, she's yeah. a good candidate, especially the family members. Yeah. But it does work. Right, and I think you have to test the stool because some people can be asymptomatic carriers of pathogens, and so you want to do it through a medical facility so you can have it all tested. Yeah. Right. Yes. I was wondering if you looked or heard anything about the um, a C-section versus a vaginal birth and how that affected the microbe? That, that, that is um, one of the um, uh, findings from, um, I guess it's not the Human Microbiome Project. But interestingly, if you have a um, vaginal birth, then you um, have kind of the vaginal microbiome. And if you are cesarean, then you have the skin microbiome. And apparently, I mean, there are studies that look at vaginal, this vaginal um, birth is uh, more um, protective going forward in terms of, I don't know what exactly they've looked at, but establishing what would be considered kind of a healthy microbiome. And I know one of the leaders of the field, Rob Knight, his wife had a, a C-section and they immediately, um, yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. And um, so, you know, that's not been studied, but yes, that is what he did in. They get a lot of more um, allergies and just. The C section? Yes. 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 And there are also, I don't do the, the, the kids and babies research, but there's also with breast, breastfeeding, appears to be. Um, important for gut microbiome specifically, but yeah. So it's really remarkable. And the other remarkable thing about that, one thing I will say about kids is that when you look at, oh, I think I even have a picture of this. Um, I know you guys love my slides, so I want to, oh, here it is. So you can see here, when does the adult, adult gut microbiome become established? And you can see all this, all the change right, up until about age three, and then it's very stable. And then in, um, in older age, it starts to change again. But through um, adulthood, it's um, really pretty stable within person, yeah. Okay, for the twin study where one gained weight and the other one didn't based on the microbes, that was the first slide, oh. did they find a solution or did they, what did they do or did they find something, a probiotic or something to change the microbes so that both would consume the same diet and have the same body composition? Well, what, one of the things that this early, so this is a very early study. And one of the, um, so what, one of the notions that they came out with was, you know, if you, um, and we don't know causally which direction this goes, but the, the bugs here of the obese twin are very efficient energy harvesters. So every calorie you eat is taken in. And so if those are your bugs and you're given to the mouse, then the mouse, even though it's, it, these are, mice are on the same diet, calorically, compositionally, they gain weight because they're eking out every single calorie. And Early on, they, ha they focused on this uh, ratio between Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes um, um, in some of these studies as, a, as associated with obesity. But the results ultimately, after 10 years of research, they're inconsistent. And I think that makes sense because there is so much diversity within these um, phylum. There might have been um, subsequent studies that did something like that, but I, I, I don't know. If, I don't know if they've if they've looked at the specific um, composition of the microbiota and tried to. Yeah, that's a little bit difficult because you know, in order to work with it, then you have to start to think about culture. And we started, you know, culturing these things is actually very difficult. 
Yeah, and so that's one of the challenges is that, um, you know, as we move and we want more mechanistic work and you want to look at individual bugs, then you get back to more of that model. And part of why we've learned so much is because um, we got to move away from that by doing the sequencing. But so now people are saying, you know, we're really going to need to integrate these two approaches so that we can study more. Yeah. Oh. I just had a really quick question. Do you find that um, in studying the things with the microbiome, the people that have thyroid issues with metabolism, does that affect anything if you change their diet or have any um, effect because it's metabolized, it's metabolism regulating that? Do you find anything? You know, I don't personally, I haven't seen anything on thyroid. That doesn't mean it's not there. It's just I, um, I'm just not in that literature at all. Um, so. Katie, <laughs> um, I want to be respectful also of our host, 46, so um, I think we're going to have to wrap it up, but if there's something else you'd like to add to uh, conclude this session, please do now. <laughs> <laughs> These are just our major study questions. Um, can we define the critical gut microbial components associated with health and disease? How will individual response to diet relate to the gut microbiota? And what will this mean for the future of individual and population level dietary interventions? Thank you very much. That's our last. Thank you.